Welcome back to Combat Mission Shock Force 2, where we're going to take a look at the US Marine Rifle Company, what it's armed with, how it's organised, and how to get the most out of it in combat mission. The Marines are unique in Shock Force in that they have distinctly non-mechanised infantry. Everybody else has, by hypothetical 2008, made a transition to motorised, mechanised and armoured infantry. Even the dismounted or light infantry options for, for example, the US Army and the Brits, reflect a general trend towards smaller squad or section sizes mandated by the limited capacity of armoured personnel carriers and infantry fighting vehicles. This also shows up in equipment. Getting in and out of vehicles with longer weapons is awkward, so there's been a shift towards shorter infantry small arms with folding stock, carbine or bullpup designs. Not so the Marines. Marine riflemen in Shock Force 2 are armed with the M16A4, which has a 20 inch barrel compared to the 14 and a half inches of the M4 carbine. A longer barrel translates into a higher muzzle velocity. A higher muzzle velocity translates into a more accurate projectile with a flatter trajectory and therefore a greater effective range. In Shock Force, it's aided in this by a 4x ACOG optic which gives the rifleman some magnification and a good reticle so that he can exploit the potential of that greater effective range in a way that the unmagnified red dot sights on Shock Force's M4s don't allow. This is a long-winded way of saying that marine riflemen with M16A4s are capable of engaging targets at range with greater success than other infantry with carbines and or iron sights or non-magnified optics. The M16A4 fires NATO 5.56mm ammunition from 30 round magazines in either single shot or three round burst modes. The concept behind burst fire is that troops firing on full auto will generally get the first three rounds on target and miss with any more thanks to the recoil, so adding a mechanical limiter prevents soldiers from wasting ammunition. In game, the Marines will transition to burst fire from single shot once the target is inside about 150 meters. There are two riflemen in each marine fire team. These are led by a team leader, whose M16A4 has been fitted with an M203 grenade launcher. This is a single shot under barrel weapon firing 40mm high explosive or high explosive dual purpose grenades. It's effective against area targets out to about 350 meters and point targets inside 150. The HEDP grenades carry a tiny shaped charge warhead and they are capable of penetrating the light armour on vehicles like BMPs and inflicting subsystem damage on more heavily armoured ones. Both this and the straight high explosive grenade have a lethal radius of about 5 metres and the shrapnel can potentially fly all the way out past the 100, though you'd have to be seriously unlucky to catch some at that range. Casualties cores are likely to be a lot closer. The final member of the fire team carries an M249 Squad Automatic Weapon, or SAW. This also uses 5.56 NATO ammunition, so there is perfect ammunition compatibility across all the fire team's weapons, and it uses 200 round belts. It's also fitted with a 3.4x M145 machine gun optic, and the gunner can engage targets out to 700 meters with it. Actually hitting anything at 700 meters is a different matter entirely, but the rounds can get there and at closer ranges a belt fed weapon can put down a lot of fire. That rounds out the marine fire team. A team leader with an M16A4 and M203, an automatic rifleman with an M249 and two riflemen with M16A4. They all have night vision and body armor. Together they carry about 850 rounds of 5.56, 18 high explosive and 8 HEDP 40mm grenades for the M203, 10 hand grenades, and finally, a total of three light anti tank weapons, two Law 66s carried by one of the riflemen and the saw gunner, and an M136 AT4 carried by the other rifleman. The M72 Law, or Law 66, is a light anti tank weapon with a 66mm heat warhead. This is more effective against vehicles than the 40mm grenades from the M203 because it's got a bigger shaped charge, while the M136 84 is a more modern weapon with an even larger 84mm heat warhead. The bigger warhead basically translates into better armour penetration capability, so it's more effective against armour than both the other options. This does not mean that either of them are going to be knocking tanks out with ease. 
they're both one use disposable weapon, so the fiery gets one chance to hit and then ditches the empty launch tube. If you miss, that's it. While both of them have a range of a couple of hundred meters and their armor penetration doesn't drop off over distance because they use shaped charges, they're a lot more effective at close range where they have a higher hit probability. One final note is that the AT4 is the CS variant for confined space. One of the problems with weapons like this is the backblast. All the exhaust gases of the rocket firing have to go somewhere, and sharing an enclosed confined space with them is very bad for your health. So the AT4CS reduces the velocity of the projectile a little bit and adds a saltwater countermass to the rear of the weapon, which does a lot to absorb that backblast and make it safer to fire indoors. It's still not fun. Troops firing them and the smaller 66 inside buildings will still suffer some suppression in combat mission, but they're less likely to pin or injure themselves. So that's the Marine Infantry Fire Team in Shock Force. Each Marine squad has three of these for a total of 12 Marines, plus a squad leader in the A Fire Team who is armed like a standard rifleman with the addition of some binoculars and a radio. Also unique to the A Fire Team is the option to swap the team leader's M203 for an M32 multiple grenade launcher. This is essentially a giant 40mm grenade firing revolver with six shots. At the time that the original Shock Force Marine module was being put together, the Marines were looking as though they were going to procure the M32 en masse, but ultimately they didn't. So it is a kind of hypothetical option. In practical terms, it can put out six shots before needing to be reloaded, as opposed to the M203, which needs to be reloaded every shot. The team leader still carries his M16A4 as well, so realistically this is something of a minor difference. It's broadly comparable to the M203. Carrying both weapons at the same time and having to swap between them seems like an awful lot more hassle than just using the M16A4 with the M203 attached, but I don't think there's much in-game difference. There are three rifle squads like this in a platoon, led by a platoon HQ and backed up by a four squad armed with machine guns, and a fifth squad, which is the assault squad. The platoon HQ consists of a lieutenant, sorry, a lieutenant, and his assistant, both armed with M16A4. The machine gun squad is split into two teams, armed with M240G general purpose machine guns. The M240G is a variant of the FN Mag firing 7.62 NATO ammo from 100 round belts. Curiously for the Marines, it doesn't have an optic. Instead, the gunner relies on iron sights and the team leader with binoculars to reach out to a distance of 1,000 meters when mounted on the tripod. As usual, the chances of swatting anything at 1,000 meters are pretty slim, never mind actually scoring any hits. Each team comes with 800 rounds of machine gun ammunition, in game, it takes 7 seconds to set the weapon up on its tripod and 10 seconds to pack it up. Although the M240 can be fired without being deployed by using the attached bipod or with significantly less accuracy by firing from the shoulder. The machine gun teams themselves consist of a team leader, a gunner and a single rifleman. The A team also contains a squad leader who has an extra pair of binoculars. The assault squad is similar, also consisting of two teams but instead armed with the Mark 153 SMORE. SMORE stands for Shoulder Launched Multipurpose Assault Weapon, which is a fancy way of saying recoilless gun with various different types of ammo. Conceptually, the best way to understand it is probably as a kind of marine RPG-7. Each small team in Shock Force 2 carries five 83mm rockets, two HEAT, or High Explosive Anti-Armor, two HEDP, and one novel explosive rocket, which is a thermobaric. The heat is a bit more powerful than the AT4 and is pretty comfortable taking on Syrian armor, provided it isn't countered by ERA. The HEDP is less effective against vehicles, but primarily designed for bunker busting, while the thermobaric round is designed to be more effective against buildings, especially if it detonates inside. Each small team consists of a small gunner equipped with the launcher and an assistant carrying more ammo. Both of them are armed with M16A4s. The teams are also equipped with demo charges and do have access to the blast command, but this doesn't work. If issued, the order becomes a quick movement command, which may have fatal consequences as the small team tries to run directly to wherever you told them to. 
In other words, don't use that if you need to blow a hole in a wall, get an actual breach team or some engineers to do it. There are three of these platoons in a company, and they're supported by some HQ assets and a light mortar section. The mortar section uses the 60mm M224. These have a minimum range of 72 meters and a maximum of 3490. A 60mm projectile is pretty small and it's going at a relatively low speed, so the accuracy does drop off fast with range. This is an issue because, also due to the size of the mortar bomb, it doesn't pack a massive punch and it really needs to be quite accurate to do damage. Each mortar team is 3 marines strong and carries a total of 51 bombs, 46 high explosive and 7 smoke. They can be called on for indirect fire, but using them in a direct fire roll beyond enemy small arms range seems like it would be more effective. This is a weapon that is there to support the infantry at relatively short ranges, picking off enemy teams and smoking up or suppressing them. Finally, the mortar section is led by a two-man HQ team. Rounding out the company is the company HQ and the XO team, both with three men, a two-man fist or fire support team, a two-man forward observer team with a laser designator, and two javelin teams. Javelin should be pretty familiar to anyone who's played the modern combat mission games. It's a shoulder-launched anti-tank guided missile with a 127mm tandem heat warhead, fire and forget guidance, and the famous top attack capability. In the context of Shock Force 2, Javelin is incredibly effective against any armoured target the Marines are likely to encounter, even targets with explosive reactive armour. It has a very high chance of scoring a hit out of 2,500 metres, and because it's easily man portable, the team can shoot and scoot to minimise its exposure to enemy return fire. In addition, the launch unit has a thermal imager, so they are good for spotting, especially at night or in other conditions of poor visibility, and they are absolutely worth keeping handy even if you're not up against enemy armoured opposition. So, that's an overview of the weapons, organisation and capabilities of the Marine Infantry Company in Shock Force 2. What's it for then, and how do you use it? The first thing that really stands out about the Marines in Shock Force is how many of them there are. Each squad essentially has an extra fire team on anyone they're likely to come up against, so they basically have a third again as much firepower. This means that, on a one-to-one -one squad basis, Marines can put more fire out, that fire is likely to be more effective inside 300 meters due to the proliferation of optics, and thus a Marine squad has a better chance of achieving fire superiority than pretty much anybody else. The fact that you can split it down into three teams is also an advantage in combat mission terms. In the attack, the Marines can work a one-third maneuver, two-thirds fire support split instead of the 50-50 split that two team squads can, allowing the Marines to maintain a higher level of suppression while they move forward. Additionally, three teams opens up more splitting options to begin with. While the standard split gives you three balanced fire teams, splitting off a scout team, then an assault group, gives you a more specialised three-element squad. A two-man scout team out in front, then a five-man assault team armed with M16A4s, and a six-man fire support team armed with three grenade launchers and three saws. Or, if you want to put it in a fancier way, a very small scouting and penetration element, a rifleman-based exploitation element, and a fire support element. Naturally though, isolated squad-on-squad -squad engagements are pretty rare, but the concept of infantry overmatch extends up the company to organic fire support from the light mortars. There are three of these, which would allow you to distribute one per platoon to deal with troublesome enemy positions using high explosive or smoke bombs. So providing you can leverage the marines' firepower and numbers, they are very effective against enemy infantry. The problem with that is that pure infantry formations are pretty rare in shock force outside of Syrian militia units and the Uncons, most Red 4 opposition is going to be rolling around in BTRs or BMPs, and may well be backed up by tanks. These have three significant advantages over Marine infantry. Mobility, carrying capacity, and protection. Clearly, anything on wheels or tracks is going to get from point A to point B faster than a crowd of foot mobile Marines, except in dense, restrictive terrain. Usually, the more mobile of two forces can decide the terms of any engagement. 
they have a greater choice of terrain that they can defend or attack over. This mobility goes hand in hand with carrying capacity. A marine squad might bring 2,700 rounds of small arms ammo to the fight, compared to a Syrian mechanized squad's 1,140, but the mech squad also has another 2,000 stashed in its BTR or BMP, along with an extra 5 RPG rounds, and something that the marines aren't bringing to the fight at squad level, a 14.5mm heavy machine gun with a coax. That's not something that's really man portable. And even the old, much maligned BTR 60PB is proof against the marines' small arms fire. They might be able to put out a hail of light anti-tank weapons, but for reliable hits with M203s, Law 66s, 84s and smalls, they really need to be within the effective range of the BTR's weapons. Which is a function of the terrain and, given the comparative mobility of the BTR, how close the driver is prepared to allow the marines to get. To put it in gaming terms, a platoon of BTRs can kite a platoon of marines with enough space and favourable terrain with relatively low risk. They might not be able to inflict heavy casualties, but they can certainly get some hits in and slow the marines down long enough for the rest of the Syrians to get to the party and bring more destructive firepower to bear. And that's just BTRs, which are really at the bottom of the barrel. BMPs especially BMP-2s with a 30mm cannon or tanks can do the same thing and inflict considerably more hurt in the process. This really implies two things at platoon level. The marines need to pick their battles very carefully and exploit the terrain to make sure they only fight enemy vehicles at close range and or they need backup. The company has some organic ATGM capability in the form of the javelin and while this is an excellent weapon that's a hard limit of maximum effectiveness. The Marines do have other assets to help their infantry out at battalion or Marine Expeditionary Unit level, such as tow Humvees, LAVs and Abrams, but we're just dealing with the rifle company here. To look at these same issues from a Blue 4 perspective, a US Army Striker Infantry Platoon brings wheeled mobility, four heavy machine guns or automatic grenade launchers and four javelins to the fight. So a Striker Platoon has twice as many javelins as the US Marine Company. This does have a lot to do with the fact that the army has a lot more money than the marines and javelins are expensive, but it's also a function of the advantages of motorised or mechanised infantry. A US army platoon with Bradleys is even more ridiculous with 25mm cannons and tow missiles. This is a long-winded way of saying that marine infantry is not there to do the same jobs as army mechanised infantry. The marine rifle company is light infantry. It may not have great tactical mobility, but when combined with other assets, assets that it usually sails around with, it has great operational and strategic mobility. Marines are typically already aboard a ship. They can be pre-positioned near likely conflict zones, and when they need to go in, the rifle company hops into boats, landing craft or helicopters that it is already co-located with and just deploys. It's very difficult to do that with heavier mechanized units. They take up a lot more space on ships and they need friendly ports to offload in, while even air transportable vehicles like the Striker can usually only be transported to, to an aircraft and obviously need a friendly airfield to be landed on. Chances are that if a port or airfield needs to be secured in order for the mechanized forces to deploy in the first place, it's going to be the Marines who do that securing. This kind of operational mobility means that Marines can choose to deploy into favourable terrain, or to hit enemy weak points, or to play hit and run. They can usually also call on their own organic close air support in the form of, at least in Shock Forces 2008, Cobras, Harriers and F-18s. So the tactical disadvantages of light infantry like the Marine Rifle Company, compared to heavier more mechanised units, are counterbalanced by operational and strategic advantages, especially with regards to speed of deployment. They are organised and equipped the way they are for a reason. In combat mission terms, bearing these characteristics in mind is mostly important in terms of scenario design and quick battle force selection. On the player end, the Marine Rifle Company is different from anything else in Shock Force 2, being a light infantry force focused on infantry overmatch and backed up by a hail of short-range light anti-armour weapons. This makes them interesting to play, but their organisation, weapons and equipment does present challenges 
which increase the further they get away from their terrain and enemy force makeup comfort zones. Hope you enjoyed this one and found it useful. I'll catch you in the next video.